Good afternoon, everybody, or in Charles's case, good evening to those fans in the UK and to Charles. We're here today to talk about two wonderful books, primarily Box 88, which is Charles Cummings' 10th spy novel, which is coming out, well, actually came out yesterday, right? That was your, yep. so a toast to you. And forthcoming on February 21st, a new novel by the fabulous Joseph Cannon called The Berlin Exchange set in 1963, obviously in Berlin. And Joe will be back to talk to us about his book on February 21st, in fact. Uh, but meantime, he's agreed to join us to talk about Box 88 and maybe talk a bit about spy fiction. So Charles, I looked up a few things because I haven't seen you since 19, no, 2017. Lord, I'm in the last century. Um, and I recognize uh -huh. that interestingly, this is the 10th book for each of you, if I've counted correctly, is that right? Right. And Joe, Joe had a whole career, full, uh, superb career in publishing, and, and then started writing quite sort of quite late in, in life, right, compared to most authors. Yes, it's the poster boy for midlife crisis, I suppose. But anyway, I started writing books. I think, I think Raymond Chandler wrote The Big Sleep when he was 54. Is that right? I don't know, but it's a very good year. <laughs> I've always thought it was interesting, Joe, that you could go from being an editor and a publisher to being an author. Did that sort of feel like taking a step back into servitude or did it feel like you were asserting yourself moving forward? It was, you know, the serious answer is that they're so entirely different. And it's, it's really, you know, when you face a blank sheet of paper, you're just like everybody else and all of the publishing training in the world doesn't help. What you do have to learn, however, is to let go and not publish it yourself you know, let the publisher be the publisher and just remove yourself from that process and do what you need to do, which is tricky. Um, you don't, having been an editor, uh, having read a great deal, it, that is to say professionally, it might be that you're more alert to mistakes on the page or you're more alert to infelicities. But in fact, I think it's pretty much the same. I think I probably started the way Charles started. You know, you start with an idea and a paper and you take it from there. Although Charles has a wonderful start, and this reminds me, of course, of John le Carre, and that Charles, as I understand it, when um, you're born in Scotland, right? And then yeah. educated at Eton. But anyway, as you're making your way out of university, yeah, there was a, what, a recruitment effort by MI, which one, five or six? Uh, yeah, by, by MI6, when I was 25. I uh, went to stay with my mum and my stepfather for the weekend, and there was a man there who had recently retired from what, what is formerly called SIS, the Secret Intelligence Service. And he did the, 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 sort of the, the old tap on the shoulder and put me up for uh, some interviews and, and, and psychological tests and profiles and that sort of thing. And I didn't get in, but I had this remarkable experience, and, and I had always wanted to be a, an author. So... The, the experience that I'd had was kind of crying out to be dramatized. And then that became my first novel, A Spy by Nature. But it, there's a, look, it's quite a useful ambiguity because I think people think that I was like David Cornwall, that I really did work for MI5 or MI6 for years and then be, be, became a novelist. I, I really didn't. I never worked for them. Um, Scout's honor. And um, it, it's certainly ever in America in my publicity material that always says, former Secret Service recruit, Charles Cumming. But I'm really not. Nobody ever believes you when you say that, you know. I mean, every time <laughs> I've been at a book event, someone will in, inevitably say, as for the tradecraft in the book, uh, I suppose you come by that through experience. And I say, no, no, I've, I've never been in the secret services. And they go, well, of course you would say that, wouldn't you? And so, yeah, yeah. you know, you, it's, it's a no-win. But well, also it's, a, it's a win-win, it makes it sound more interesting. They oh. say to you? What do they actually say to you when they recruit? I'd be curious. Sorry, I interrupted you, Joan, so I didn't hear your question. What do they actually say to you when they recruit you? Well, they, well, they didn't recruit me, but I just, I had um, two long interviews in, uh, just off the mall, very close to where the, the, the Queen lives in Buckingham Palace. Um, this is a long, long time ago in, in uh, 1995, I think, 1994. Um, and then I, I did what we call over here the civil service exams, but they were tailored specifically for SIS. And then that was when my brief encounter with them ended. They, they, they sort of said you could go across the river, that euphemistically said you could go across the river, which is MI5 on the north side of the Thames, and talk to them. But I was either too stupid or too stubborn to say, to understand what they were even talking about. And, and so I went off and did something totally different. But I had this material 
um, weighing me down, kind of crying out to be to be turned into a book. And so, in a frag fl flagrant breach of the Official Secrets Act, I wrote *A Spy by Nature*. And later, used this material. <clears throat> I love in *Moroccan Girl*. It's really about an espionage novelist who is recruited to be a spy, only to discover that sometimes he was doing it better than real life, etc. I mean, you have a lot of fun with that mirroring effect in the book. I think it's really terrific. I'm, thank you, Joe. I'm glad you enjoyed that. That was a, a, a slight, if I use the phrase a Marmite book, does that make sense in the States? Yeah. Marmite over here is this very powerful yeasty uh, paste that we put on toast and some people love it, some people hate it. But the Moroccan girl which over here is called The Man Between uh, was very much a Marmite book. But, it, but yeah, it, it, it was a sort of wish fulfillment thing to a certain extent because I had been sitting basically like this in front of a computer for 20 years. Um, and as you will know, as, as well as anybody, writers don't get out much and have much adventure. So to send a, an author into Morocco and to turn him into an intelligence officer for the period of time that he was out there was um, was exciting to me and to, 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 to tell that story. And I think also you're a fan of Eric Ambler too, aren't you? And, and it, the, the book was a sort of homage to those wonderful Eric Ambler books of, of, of yesteryear where you take a sort of an ordinary man and, and, and put him into extraordinary circumstances. And he, he had Charles Latimer in, um, uh, the coffin for Demetrius. Um, and so uh, Kip Carradine was a sort of um, version of, of, of Charles Latimer, um, who in, the, in Demetrius, he meets the, the head of Turkish intelligence, Colonel Haki, who says, yes, you've been writing these stories, you've been making things up for years, but now let me show you something really true, and sort of takes him into, into the underground of the, of the, of the, of the, of the Istanbul ma mafia, so to speak. Um, so that's where Moroccan Girl came from, but it was also a sort of um, I wanted to try and talk about Trump and, and Steve Bannon and all the craziness that's been going on in your country and that has sort of infected us over here with Brexit and has trickled down to Turkey and many other places, the sort of um, white nationalism and all that, but which I don't think really sort of got, was, I, I was successful in getting that across to readers. I think they saw it more as a sort of entertainment, but, I, but it, it did have this political undercurrent that I wanted to get across, which didn't necessarily land. I don't know whether that's just British readers or I don't know. Well, right there, you've brought up my point about we could talk about in a moment, the difference between the British approach and the American approach to writing spy fiction. Remind me also, if you can stick around after, I have a hilarious story I could tell you about spy novels in Morocco. D Daniel Silva's um, book that wandered off to Morocco. It's pretty funny, but I won't waste time here. In any case, um, you have written uh, two books about an Alex Milius, and I gathered that someday you might write a third to like complete the trilogy. And then you've written three about Thomas Kell. I'm just reading from your website, so I'm not making yeah. it up. Well, I think I think when we met, uh, Barbara, I was I was uh, touring around the states with um, with the first, or perhaps the second Thomas Kell book. So that was a trilogy of, of, of novels about a disgraced intelligence officer, an MI6 officer who had um, sort of fallen on a hard time, so to speak, in, in, in after the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq. And then the Milius books were were a spy by nature and, and, a, and the Spanish game set in Madrid. In fact, I'm talking to you from an Airbnb in Madrid where I often come back to, to work and to isolate and to write um, to, to do the third book in the, in the um, in the kite trilogy, I've got so many different uh, <laughs> sequences. It's hard to keep track, but um, Box Eighty Eight is the first of a new of a new series. But to answer your question, Alec Millis, I would love to do the third Millis book. It sort of feels like unfinished business, um, but it's just it, the, the, the time has never been quite right, and and uh, I've moved on to other things. And and as uh, Joe will attest, you know, the, the, you you sort of write the story that you that you want to write and feel like writing at that particular moment in time. And, and sometimes you sort of have to let things lie fallow for a while. But Joe, you don't, you don't like to write, um, you know, continuous series heroes, but why Berlin is almost like, you know, the, the thing you come back to. Uh, why is Germany as opposed to other locations in the war so interesting? I suppose I do serial places rather than serial yeah. people, you know. Um, you know, the books are movies in my head. And when they're over, they're over. It, it never occurred to me to really continue on with um, the protagonist, although I think it's commercially desirable. I mean, publishers like it, readers like it, et cetera. And it's uh, no doubt a challenge to do. 
it's just never occurred to me. I remember after the first one, somebody said, what happens afterwards? And I said, oh, I don't know. They get a horse farm and they fall in love or something. You know, who cares? The movie's over. And I don't really want to carry on with it. The place, however, is a different thing. And it's, it's almost inexplicable. Some places grab your imagination and won't let go. Some places you may love them, but you don't think to write about them. I'm, I'm never going to write a novel about Paris because why? Everybody else has, and it just doesn't occur to me. But Berlin was one of those places that once attracted to it, it just was the gift that kept on giving. I think it's an absolutely fascinating thing. And if you're at all interested in history, that is to say of our last century, it's all there. It's just physically there in the, in the bricks. It's I once described it as like grass that grows up between the pavement, that history is just, you cannot, even after you've cut it back, it'll grow up again. It's just always there. And I realized with this one that I had not by intention finished a kind of trilogy about Berlin. The first one was 1945, it was Potsdam. So it's Stunde Null, it's really the ground zero for the destruction, for the a destroyed city. The second leaving Berlin was the airlift, the return of the intellectuals, Brecht, that whole era. And I thought, oh, this is my wall book. Somebody's got to do, you know, if you're going to do Berlin, inevitably you do the wall. And this is 63, so that's, I think I'm done with it though. I think I've really written my last Berlin book, but famous last words, I don't know. Right, well, because I love you. When we went to Berlin, I stayed at the Adlon so I could look at the Brandenburg Gate. And then I've been to Potsdam where there was, you know, the bridge, I can't remember the name of it, but the bridge where- Glienicke, the Glienicke Bridge. Okay, and that's where exchanges were, were also made. So, um, you know, one of, the, one of the great things about these books is that you do get to visit different landscapes, even if you're not in contemporary time, you know, European cities in particular don't change all that much. Although having said that, the East End of London or Hamburg, you know, flattened in the war. So, so clearly they, they have changed, but um, I really love the perspective that we get. So Charles, why don't you give us a quick summary as far as you wanna go of box 88 before we digress off into other fields. Oh, sure, so before I do, I'd love to just tell Joe this, that about five years ago, I, I had this great honor of being asked by, um, David Simon, who created The Wire, and Ed Burns to, to, to come on board a, a, a TV show that they were developing, which sadly was never made, called Legacy of Ashes, about the history of the CIA. And they needed, in order to get British financing, they needed to give it a British angle. So I was the British guy who was going to do the MI6 stuff. And I, and I am no expert at all on uh, World War II or, or sort of immediate uh, post-war um, mission American uh, espionage, any more than sort of a kind of armchair expert. So in order to... This is a, it was, a, it was a prestigious gig and I wanted to do it well. So I read a lot of books, but the, but the, the books that were most useful to me um, in terms of creating uh, atmosphere and putting me in the place and, and creating a kind of visual landscape and map were, were, were Joe's books. They were, they were fantastic, particularly uh, leaving Berlin. Um, so it's nice to have a chance to, to thank him for that. Even though the show was never made, it was, um, it, I, I, I thought they were just fantastic books. Well, maybe they'll make it yet. Anyway, meanwhile, you owe me a dinner. We can have the <laughs> Valley Ho in Scottsdale. Yeah, well, that'd yeah. be absolutely perfect. I would indeed. Anyway, Lachlan Kite, um, tell us a little yeah. bit about him because you're obviously investing in three books so we should get to know him here with the first one, Box 88. Yeah, so um, so oddly, the, the Box 88 came out in the UK about 18 months ago and then had got sort of curdled up in the, in the pandemic and various other things. So only, only this week is, is, is it coming out um, uh, in, in North America. And it's, it's this, as you say, it's the story of Lachlan Kite, uh, but in, I think, a sort of slightly unique way, it has, it has two uh, narrative strands. You, you, you see Kite as a young man uh, of uh, 18 being recruited into this Anglo-American intelligence service, Box 88, um, and the adventures and the, and the, and the, and the problems that he encounters um, as a young man on his first mission. And then you also see him as a man of, of my age, a man of in his, in his late 40s, uh, uh, as the sequence goes on, in, in early 50s, um, uh, who is now a senior member of, of Box 88. In fact, he's running the UK operation. Um, and this, in the first novel, uh, his first operation comes back to, to haunt him, so to speak. Something, something from the past needs to be settled and, and reckoned with. And that's really the, 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 the basic uh, narrative drive of of Box 88. 
Well, Lockerbie is the thing that, um, which, you know, for those of us of any age was a traumatic event that we can, we can all remember for sure. Exactly. It was, um, so in, in the novel, there's, there, there is the concern that um, the, the Iranian uh, government, sort of uh, the post-revolutionary Ayatollah Khomeini government um, bankrolled um, the, the tragedy of, of Lockerbie. And therefore, and there's a character, a fictional character I've created uh, who is being looked at by Western intelligence as a kind of a bag man for, that, for, for Lockerbie and who is now plotting, potentially plotting other atrocities in on the eastern seaboard in the in the United States, so Kite in, at a small level becomes involved in investigating this man. Uh, but a bit sort of from a personal point of view, I grew up in in Scotland. I was born in Ayr, which is a little town on the west coast. And on the on the night of the Lockerbie bomb, I was I was probably half an hour up the coast. You know, the the plane would have got flown over where my family were living. So um, it, it was sort of particularly. Well, sort of specifically traumatic um, and I feel as though with, all, with everything that's happened since then in the world it's almost sort of been forgotten Lockerbie but it was a, an absolutely ghastly thing and the more I looked into it the more I investigated it, it was tr truly shocking and I don't think there's ever really been a proper reckoning for the, the families and the, and the, and the victims of, of that tragedy as, as long ago as it was. So Box 88, you talk about Box, it's an elite transatlantic black ops. And this came up last night. We did a, a book launch for Brad Taylor, who writes um, the task force. And, you know, we we thought about Sigma Force, which is James Rollins' black op, and then we could go to Tom Clancy and think about the campus, or we could talk about the Custlers and Newman all. Why is it um, that, you know, a, an off-the-books operation is so intriguing to write about. Joe, you, you've stuck with the real deal, haven't you, throughout yours? I'm trying to remember, you've not ever created a, like a, you know, offshoot black ops kind of a thing in your books. No, I never have. Um, I would imagine the appeal, however, is that if it's a rogue unit, um, there are no rules and even the writer can do whatever he wants. You know, you can just make it up. Um, I've stayed in, the, when I'm talking about the spy world, Mostly what I'm talking about is the aftermath and the uh, effect it has on the on the characters themselves. The books are not really fill, not as filled as, as much filled as Charles's are with um, people in the field and actually doing that work and sort of playing the sort of cat and mouse game and the chase through the square, et cetera, et cetera. There's a little bit, not so much, partly because I'm not really certain how all of that operates. I mean, you tend to make it up as you go along. And I thought, okay, well, if you were in that situation, what would you do? But when you then read some of the memoirs that come out about actual ops in the field and you see how wild and surreal and sort of zany they are, you know, cutouts that pop up in cars so that people think they're being followed, et cetera. And I thought, you know, I couldn't do that. So I kind of stayed to the office and passing papers on park benches and sort of tried and true Cold War things because I, I gather they are true and they certainly make sense for me. And it's not the primary interest. I'm, I'm much more interested in the effect that spying has on the people who do it and also on the families. What happens, you know, um, one of the books that I wrote was called Defectors and it's about spies who end up in Moscow having defected back to the ideological home country and having sacrificed everything in their lives for this, how are they living? What's it like for them there? What, you know, what, what are their days like? This was obviously based um, to a large extent on what happened to Philby once he yeah. fetched up in Moscow ne and never repented and remained a proud KGB officer till his death. Nevertheless, it was a day-to-day -day kind of sorrowful life. And anyway, it interested me. I'm sort of going off field here talking about Russia and Moscow and KGB, that's not really our point. But I think rogue operations are A, fascinating because you can say whatever you like, but B, because they now have become part of spying. I think they, uh, it's in the last 25 to 30 years, they've become so, so much a part of how these organizations operate in a way that they never had been during the Cold War, that um, it's worth dealing with. And I think I, 
applaud you keeping up with things. I mean, I find that I'm now at 1963. My first book was set in 45, and my wife insisted if I just keep going, I may write a contemporary novel at some point. <laughs> but I tell her that I can't keep up with the technology. You know, by the time I finally understand iPhones, they're they're well onto something else. So I think I'm going to stay on park benches in the Cold War. It makes a lot more sense for me. I think it, it, there's an interesting point you're making that um, it's something to do with the difference between real life and storytelling, and that the public may or may not know really anything about espionage and how it's truly conducted. Some people might think that it's like uh, the Bourne identity. Some people might think it's like Alias or McHeron's novels or John le Carre's novels. And the truth is it's not like any of them. And that really our responsibility is to is just to tell terrific stories and to use the sort of architecture of the of the espionage genre to to make those stories more exciting and more interesting and, and to populate them as you do with with, with people who are buffeted by you know the impact of, of the secret life um the technology thing is interesting actually and it applies to box 88 that um i i'd got to a point where i'd i'd, I'd written so many contemporary novels uh, in, in, well not so many but you know, more than sort of half a dozen and i, and I kind of hit it constantly against the, the technology problem against the sort of the the, the iphone problem as i call it which is that st storytelling has been completely changed by um, by cell phones and by and by Wi-Fi and by the internet and by the fact that you can be found at any point, you can call for help if you need help. You can you can look something up at the, at the touch of a button. You, a, a protagonist is is or an antagonist is is no longer. It's very difficult to put them in peril because because they or, or to for them to escape because they can be found. Um, and I said to my editor, my British editor over here. That I was thinking of writing a series of books set in the literally in the 1990s, from from sort of 89 through to to 9/11, and um, and she said, yeah, it's a it's a good idea, but you've made your name writing contemporary spy fiction. It's a shame to give that up, and that's where the the sort of the dual narrative idea of Box 88 came from, which was to um, so so I still I'm still stuck with the I, with the iPhone problem in in the contemporary strands of Box 88 and its sequel due to 62. But then I have the luxury of going back in time, and it's not that long ago that there was no Google and there was no cell phone and there was no number plate recognition cameras and there was no satellites and all the rest of it. And it and it and it's much more like Joe's books, Moscow Rules, chalk marks on walls, um, uh, sick red flags on a balcony to indicate that you need to speak to somebody or, or whatever the tradecraft might be. And in some ways, the storytelling is more fun and, and possibly more compelling in the in the in the in the twentieth century strand, be, purely because you don't have tech, the, the the kite doesn't have technology to fall back on, and slightly easier to write. Uh, you know, when everything is knowable, almost instantaneously, it's really hard to create that tension and drama that you get interpersonally in. The, in that yeah, and the surveillance, you know, between, I mean, especially in the UK where there's, you know, you can barely go an inch without being on camera um, with all those CCTV and, um, you know, facial recognition programs. Now, girl, last time I flew to Frankfurt, my, my face was my entrance onto, into the airplane. They didn't, they, you didn't even use a ticket. You walked through the facial recognition stuff at LAX and and there you were. Of course, I've said for years that I don't think a paper passport is what we ought to be carrying. I think, you know, it, it actually ought to be us that um, that prevails. But I think it is harder to write a spy novel. But you guys have touched on something I think is interesting because, you know, in the whole range of spy fiction, some people read it for spycraft. You know, mm -hmm. spycraft itself can be a whole thing or a rogue. Out. When we were talking military fiction last night, what what we you know mentioned, you could get almost anything right. wrong in military fiction except weaponry. But if you make a mistake about the gun or whatever, you know you're going to get clobbered by, by the fans. So in spy fiction, I think you you need to know your spy craft if you're going to go that direction. Would you say it actually this? did happen about the gun I, when I was researching the Good German? I looked dutifully at the kind of gun that would have been carried by the occupation forces and put it in the book, except I had forgotten whether it was a cylinder or a slingback, and I got it wrong. It was thankfully picked up by the copy editor who said, no, 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 I think this special gun was like this. But in the galleys that went to the UK, 
it hadn't been picked up. And I started getting emails from Australia and all over the Commonwealth saying any bloody fool knows that this isn't the way the gun <laughs> was. And I thought, you know, from now on, I'm just going to push people out of windows. It's so much easier. And you get the same effect anyway. So well, I think that's how Ian Fleming uh, or Jack, how James Bond ended up having a wolf of PPK. Because in, I may be wrong about this, and I'm sure there'll be a, a, a Fleming aficionado watching this will correct me later. But I think in Casino Royale, Fleming is sorry, Bond is carrying a different gun to subsequent novels. And somebody wrote into him and said, now look here, old boy, he wouldn't be carrying this, he'd be carrying that because it's much cozier and tighter and he can sort of fit it in his dinner jacket. Uh, but speaking of the Bond franchise, you know, one of the enduring um, attractions of it is the spy grip, you know, it, as it gets updated and so forth. You know, you've got M, you've got all that other stuff. But I was thinking, you know, let's go. I mean, my first spy novel or the one I think of is kind of the root novel here is Erskine Shoulders, you know, the riddle of the sands, which is pre-World War I and it's up in the, the freezing era. I've always thought it was so incredibly ironic that the British executed him, you know, <laughs> in yeah. 1919 for, you know, he was a member of the Irish, the IRA and so forth. So they executed him for treason, but he wrote this great spy novel favor mm -hmm. of the British. And then I can remember Philip R. MacDonald. Remember he wrote stuff in the thirties. He had one that was a whole play on broom with the Scottish spelling. Do you remember that at all, Jeremy? I'm, I'm going I'm to nod intelligently as if I know what you're talking about, but I'm afraid I don't know him. <laughs> well, it was, a, it was a terrific 1930s spy movie, but the whole thing hinged on broom, which in Scotland is spelled not the way it's pronounced. Which okay, is yeah, yeah. Right, so that was, anyway, and then we got Eric Ambler and, you know, so forth. So what, what do you see um, as the roots of spy fiction, at least for you, Joe? What, what really, you know, would you go back to and talk about? I think when we talk about our spy fiction as opposed to something from 1918 or 1939 even, I mean, it all begins with Le Carre. And I think that one of the ways to look at this is that he brought it back to the office. And what you have are these huge bureaucratic organizations, which are not even hinted at in the 1930s. You know, the Eric Ambler people are out there in their trench coats alone doing things and buying secret arms for the Spanish and et cetera, et cetera. But you never really get the sense of where they're reporting into. That Le Carre did for us. And I think he made it modern. He made it um, relatable. Everybody has worked in an office. Everybody has known the busybody. Everybody has known the person that won't let you check out the files when you need it. And he used all of those things as plot devices. And I think began what I consider contemporary spy fiction. I still like Ambler. I still like to read all of that. But I think all of us owe a debt to Le Carre now. I mean, everybody's compared to him and I think rightly so, but he, he brought it home where it belongs to the office. What about Len Dayton or even Robert Ludlum? Are they, you know, they come after or contemporaneously, actually. Well, I think they're having more fun. And I think they're not as serious as Le Carre was, who always, I mean, as you were describing before, there's always a subtext and there has to be an understory of something that we're really concerned about in order to justify the time you put into creating even these, we hope, entertaining novels. There's some fundamental seriousness at the bottom of them, um, of yours certainly, I think and I would hope of mine. I think that's what makes, it's the platform that makes the rest of it possible. I like creating plots. I like doing the quote entertainment part of it, but it's never what, ca what causes the novels. They're always about something else, or at least they were to me, however they started. I mean, Los Alamos started because I was interested in the scientists and what they thought they were doing there, making the bomb. And because it was technically a place that didn't exist, I thought, what would happen if there had been a crime? How would they go about solving that? That was the hook for me. What of course developed is that the crime that was going on all the time was espionage, so it became a novel about spies, but it's not how it started. How about you, Charles? What would you say? Well, to, to, to Dayton, I mean, over here, there's a, there's a view that Dayton, um, to, to sort of strip the class out of the of the spy novels. So you, you so you had James Bond, you had Ian Fleming, you had um, George Smiley, and then and, and going back, the, the 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 world of the secret world was a posh world, a, a populated by uh, I was going to say upper class twits, but certainly people, members of the upper class, some of whom were twits and some of whom were were, were very good at what they did. Um, 
But Dayton, who I don't believe ever worked in, in for, for MI5 or for SIS, nevertheless knew what should be known, which is that the vast majority of people that work in these organizations are not old Etonians and they're not um, educated at Oxford and Cambridge. They're, they're just uh, regular working people. And so um, Harry Palmer, uh, who's obviously not named in Dayton's novels, but it was named for, for the Michael Kay movies, uh, is extremely good at, at what he does and also sends up and, and is uh, insolent and, and insubordinate to his uh, upper class superiors in the books. So Dayton, um, some of the, the books are, are very funny in a way, but but uh, but they're also much sort of perhaps as true to life as as Le Carre's books are or were, you know, in in his in his pomp. Um, but and I, I would I, I sort of trace it back further than Joe that I would I would draw a line from kind of Rudyard Kipling's Kim through as you say the Riddle of the Sands. I don't think you get. Le Carre without Eric Ambler and, and Joseph Conrad and, and the sort of politicizing of the of the spy novel, the idea that you can tell a, a really entertaining, gripping story of suspense, but you can also run it through with a, a, a psychological dimension, a, a, a philosophical, uh, political dimension. I'm sure Joe would agree with this. It's just, um, but uh, but it, so the, so, it, so it, it tracks back probably over I don't know, 100, 120 years, certainly over here. But, but you, Barbara, you were asking when we sort of first sat down that, about the difference between the, the American yeah. spy novel and the British spy novel. And I always feel that Americans get very frustrated with us Brits, with our books, that, that we're just sort of men and women sitting in rooms talking and there aren't enough bombs going off or, or, or guns being pulled out of holsters and, and that there needs to be more action. Um, and I think that that's true. I think there is a difference. I think they're not actually not Joe's book, but they're more sort of historical thrillers, but certainly contemporary American spy fiction is much more gung-ho militaristic than contemporary British spy fiction. I mean, I, I, I think I believe that. You may, you may feel differently, but it's, um, yeah, it's true. We're, our stuff is more contemplative and, and, and psychological and, and contemporary American spy fiction um, is more... Um, is louder, whereas Joe's books or Alan Furst's books are, are more in the, you could say more in the British tradition, really. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think also that um, British espionage fiction is also concerned with the society itself, with making commentaries on, I mean, you know, an American shoot em up is, re what can you say? It's, there's a lot of pop pop and bang bang. But I think that in certainly the serious oriented British espionage novels, there's a tendency to really look at the framework of the society itself and, and certainly its detail. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's a really wonderful, intimate style. You get a lot of detail or description of how people live, what the class markers are, um, the educational markers, et cetera. I mean, speaking of which in the current book, um, I know it's almost a rite of passage for a British writer to have hated school, but did you really hate Eaton as much as you seem to have done in the book? <laughs> um, look, I, I was not a particularly impressive young man. I, I think I should have done better at Eaton. And if, if I had had a, a different set of circumstances, a different housemaster, perhaps I would have been a better student and we would have got on uh, better, the, the two of us. But um, I didn't enjoy school. I, I um, I was in, Eton is a very strange place. It's a, it's a, um, I'm sure you've seen the pictures of the boys who go around in, in, in tailcoats um, and you have busloads of Japanese and American tourists coming in almost every day, sort of peering out of the windows at you, like sort of an exhibit and uh, an animal in a zoo. Um, obviously there's the sons of hugely wealthy, um, very well-connected families there who've been going there since sort of Genesis. Um, and then just straight up and down normal families who, who think it's a good idea to send their sons there. Um, and to be an old Etonian, as I am, you sort of, you carry that around for the rest of your life. It's a, it's a sort of rucksack, you know. <laughs> um, and it's hugely advantageous in many ways. And also, I, I don't think I've, I've ever met as many people who are so messed up as, as my old Etonian friends. I mean, it's, it's a... Um, the, the, the legacy of it is quite complicated. So I guess I wanted to write about that in Box 88. So you have Lachlan Kite, who's, a, who's basically a working class boy living in Scotland, whose father has died of alcoholism at, at, when Lockie was just 11, um, who is sort of plucked from obscurity, as it were, and sent to this very elite school with its strange traditions and rules and, and um, 
hugely privileged uh, boys who were going there, um, sort of in sort of chauffeur-driven cars, if you like. Um, and he he makes a success of it. He makes much more of a success of it than I ever did, largely because he's cleverer than I was and better at cricket than I was. And I think at, at any of these schools, if you're if you're really really good at something, whether it's playing the piano or great at chess, or you've got a fantastic um, I was going to say cover drive, which is a shot in cricket. Um, you'll you'll do well, and and, and Lockie does well there. Um, but we over here have had um, two prime ministers almost back to back from from Eton, David Cameron, and now um, Boris Johnson, who hopefully his time is almost up. Um, and and they've done. Actually, I'm a fan of Cameron, but J Johnson and his clan have done immense damage to, I think, British public political life. Um, it's just a personal view. So, and there are, and there are various um, old Etonians in all sorts of different walks of life. So you can't really escape them; they're everywhere. Um, and I thought it was quite interesting just to to tell people what it was really like to to be a boy there in the 1980s. So, so you get a sense of it in in, in Box 88, um, good and bad. I do. I still think it's a it's in a remarkable school. I haven't sent my own son there, um, but. Um, that's not because of Eton, it's just because I think that sending boys or girls away from their families in their childhood is a, is a bad emotional idea um, for their development. But uh, no, it's a remarkable place and has produced amazing people. There's a wonderful hotel somewhere over there in Windsor. And if you go there out and then you can go and visit Eton and go and visit the College Museum, which I have done, which I really yeah. like. So I, I have a thought, which is, you know, thinking about differences. Um, and in, in, I think in spy fiction, there's always an element of betrayal, but there's also patriotism as a driver. And then sometimes it's just greed, like we just saw with, you know, whatever the two Americans were that were setting themselves up to sell stuff, you know, just for money. But, but for me, the British, the betrayal part, one of us, you know, I think that's why the Cambridge Five and Philby and all sort of, you know, really keeps resonating with people. How could one of us, in fact, you know, have, and you wonder, you know, was it really a commitment to an ideology? Was it just for money? Was it just, you know, what, what drove them? Where I, I think often in American spy fiction, you know, it's more patriotism or, or money um, that seems to be at the heart of it. Now I might be all wrong. That's just a personal thing. What do you guys think? I think so far as the Cambridge Five are concerned, I mean, none of them ever took any money. So it was, strictly speaking, ideological, at least at the beginning. I mean, I'm also interested in what happens once you're enmeshed in that world. It's, yeah. you don't just go away for the weekend. You know, this is who you are. It's going to define you for the rest of your life. And often the decision to become these betrayers happen at a very early age. And you often wonder, you know, what does Anthony Blunt feel at the end? You know, that sort of speculative thing. So far as the American spy fiction is concerned, I mean, I think the patriotism is just assumed. It's not, it's not something that people question. Um, whether that's right or wrong is a totally different matter. The, I think that there are certain national traumas that operate as a kind of engine to uh, foment a lot of what goes on in spy fiction. And I think certainly of the generation toward the end of our own, you know, the last century, the Philby and Cambridge betrayals really were a national trauma. It just struck to the core of British society and the way they felt about themselves, et cetera. And betrayal became the real engine that drove a lot of these books. I think the similar episode in America was the Kennedy assassination, which caused conspiracy. I mean, the, and the, it's the engine that drives so many American books is that there's a conspiracy out there and they're out there to get you. And it's, we can't, grasp it. We can't put our hands around it. We can't figure out who's really doing it. There are a lot of books with that motif, much more so than um, the personal betrayal of class or society. What, yeah, the people who do it for money really aren't that interesting and often right. get caught. I mean, I've never written about anybody who did it for money. And yeah. I think that the ideology become, and it, it's also a real question about what's going to happen to spy fiction, because the sort of thing that has um, triggered so many of these books has in fact been an ideological commitment to communism or whatever it was. I mean, now I guess it's Islam and that sort of terrorist aspect. But once, once that element is removed, it becomes perfunctory and uninteresting. It's, you know, how far are you willing to go for this? What are you really willing to 
what line are you willing to cross? I think those are the great questions and you can not toy with them, but you can certainly look at them and see the different shades and nuances that they call forth. But what do you think? Do you see it the same way, Charles? I don't know. Well, so and forgive me if I get if, if I just misjudge this or I get it wrong, but, but looking at it from this side of the Atlantic, um, we, we, we see that there are now sort of two Americas. There's a, there's a, there's a what you could broadly describe as, a, as an America of, of Trump and then there's an America of the left. I don't mean the left, like the far left, social, what would be characterized as socialist left, I just mean you know, Democrats, the, the, the coasts. Um, and it, it isn't necessarily too much of a stretch, certainly for you or I as, as storytellers, that if, let's say there was a, there was a second Trump presidency, and America turned back in that direction, um, that would, would be a, a hugely traumatic and, and certainly very politically interesting um, kind of earthquake. And the country would divide even further, I think. Um, and in those circumstances, specifically, we're talking about espionage, you could, I could easily imagine that there would be officials in the State Department or people who had access to technological secrets or pharmaceutical secrets or whatever, who, because of their loathing, let's, say, let's characterize it as loathing of a, a second Trump administration, would feel that it was in their interests financially, but also ideologically to betray their country. That might be a story that, I don't know if I'd write that, but somebody might write that story. So you could see it happening in the future. Over here, yeah, the, the, the came, to go back to the Cambridge Prize, that was a sort of socially traumatic because people couldn't believe that, that um, old Etonians and, and sort of public school boys would betray their country, but, the, but they did have good reason that, that, that in the 1930s and the run-up to the Second World War, most sort of good-hearted, well-educated uh, young men and women were communists. It was just, it, it, yeah. it, it wasn't like it, what it became you know, later. It was, it was intellectually fashionable and sort of almost morally correct to be a to be a marxist so they just got taken advantage of so to speak and then there were some of them i think like philby who were basically sociopathic and and and, and were possibly even psychopathic and, and loved the the thrill of being um yeah. you know the, the the thrill of secrecy the, the the thrill of 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 betrayal and and, and of being special elite um and and, and, and got kind of carried away with it. Um, no, I think that but, emotional component is really powerful, especially as you point out with Philby, but you know, a kind of, you know, secrecy. I, I know, only I know this and it makes me even more fabulous than I already was or whatever. You know, it's, it's, I was thinking you, you two have written primarily, well, have written spy fiction, but then there are guys like Ken Follett who's written one or so, you know, Frederick Forsyth, um, one. Um, and I think it's interesting, you know, why did they venture into it and then and do really well and then, you know, write other sorts of books. Do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, so do you mean why, why, did, why did Ken Follett do a sort of broad range of, of, of yeah, different? I mean, you know, if, if, if spy fiction, was it more like experimental or it just happened to suit a story he wanted to write, but that wasn't going to be the focus of of his major body of work, and you could say that about Forsyth as well. Well, I mean, Joe might have a perspective on this as a as a former publisher and who, who was in sitting in meetings and and and, and could sort of looked at the accountant's sheets. So sort of, but I, my view is that if you if you have a bestseller, I'm thinking I'm thinking specifically of Robert Harris, for example, right? Yeah. If, so so he wrote Fatherland and it was an international bestseller and then he immediately followed it up with uh, Archangel, which was another international bestseller. Still a, a kind of, um, they, they, they weren't, so Fatherland's obviously a kind of like what if Nazi thriller and Archangel's a sort of post-Soviet thriller. But at that point, a writer can do anything they want. Robert Harris could have set his next book on the moon and he would have got $500,000. He went to probably would have Vesuvius. sold really well. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, and it may be, I don't know Ken Follett's um, publishing history as well, but I suspect that Eye of the Needle was probably one of his first books and it was a huge hit. And then maybe he followed it up with another one. And then once, once you have that, you, as a writer, you, you're, you're good to go. Um, 
and that may explain why certainly well so then you look at Robert Harris's career and he's done fabulous thrillers about Tony Blair and he's done books set in Pompeii he's done a, a, a recent novel about uh, Neville Chamberlain and the Munich Agreement so he he has the the luxury and the kind of publishing clout to, to be able to, to do that because his name, he has such name recognition and, and, the, and the publishing has knows that they will get behind him and, and, and he'll, do, he'll do well. Um, whereas if, if you, I mean, I'm, I'm a good example, I've never had a kind of international bestseller. So if I did my next book set in Tuscany in 1756, you and I wouldn't be talking. <laughs> it, just, it would be very hard to kind of land that book commercially. So that's I think that's one answer to your question but Joe I suspect would have a different take on it well not just say that I would talk to you about Tuscany in 17 come on I'm not that <laughs> narrow-minded I presented no I know I didn't mean like that I just I just meant I'm you know I'm, I'm I fortunate to be here because, in some ways yeah. to talk. anyway there's, Joe sorry you know, there's there's an impulse not to be typed um look at Le Carre I mean after yeah. Spy and Looking Glass War he wrote The Naive and Sentimental Lover a completely different kind of book for him uh, and and indeed not successful, but, or at least in relative terms. But the idea of writing about spies and then writing huge trilogies about the Middle Ages just has never struck me as something I would want to do. I, I think we're drawn to certain stories and if you have the luxury of being able to write what you want to write, it's a luxury, it's a privilege. You can really do it. Um, I take my hat off to Ken Follett. He didn't want to write the eye of the needle over and over and which I think is what his publishers would have wanted him to do and he struck out on his own and you know wrote something else the book they tried I to think, however that you know, when you look at the body of work of most people it does not vary so widely across the lot um, they tend to be drawn to the same themes the same right. material or subject material um, a, a sort of Henry James approach, you know, you, I mean, essentially there are a few motifs and he just riffs on them and riffs on them and manages to spin wonderful literature out of it. That would be, I think, the hope for anybody, but I don't know that we can control it so much. I think that there's that from the publishing side, there's a commercial dictum to try and repeat what you've already had before. I mean, for instance, the new thing now in sales and marketing departments is that you should have the place name in the title. You know, it has to be the Paris this or the Istanbul that or whatever. The Moroccan girl. Or the Moroccan girl. And <laughs> in fact, I don't know the title. It was the man between, is that what it was in the yeah, UK? Yeah, yeah. No, or, or gender in the title. It has to be the girl, wife, sister. It's hardly ever the father, yeah. brother, but there's this whole feminine thing going on. So one last thing before we get Patrick to come and talk to us. There are people writing spy fiction that are not, you know, American or British. I'm thinking it has been my pleasure to walk Daniel Silva with him through the entire Gabriel Alon series. And, you know, now we're talking Israeli, right? And we're talking um, a whole different perspective, even though, you know, he's an American author. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to think, um, I, there's certainly books set in Asia, there, you know, there's a variety of other locations and so forth. Do you, do you feel like those are basically the same stories with just different geopolitical landscapes? I mean, I, I would agree that um, almost all writers end up writing versions of the same book. It, it's very unusual that you have a, 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 a a writer of any kind who has the kind of intellectual bandwidth to do a huge different variety of stories. I've just read Tom Stoppard's biography and there's a guy who's just clearly sort of a genius really that he can he can dip into all sorts of different times and, 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 and genres and, and, and produce wonderful work. But the, for the rest of us, I, I would agree with Joe that, that you you have a kind of a milieu and you have, and you have a, a set of circumstances, psychological, political, uh, that, that are of interest to you. And, and, and you sort of set to work on them time and time again, in a way. And you also are aware that you have write, uh, readers who are looking forward to the next installment of your, um, of, of your, of your series or, or, you know, the next Charles Cumming book or the next Joseph Cannon book. You know, it's, it's um, and Le Carre is, is, is the sort of er example of this, that he, you know, his, his books didn't really change that much. They, they changed geographically, um, but, but in terms of the content and in terms of, the, the protagonists and then the, and the romantic relationships and, the, and certainly the sort of the political undertow, they were 
sort of recognizably similar. I've got a nasty feeling I'm not answering your question. <laughs> That's what I was thinking as you were asking it. There is just an interesting, I mean, Daniel has kept his eye firmly on Russia as the real, you know, I mean, he's written books set in all sorts of other things, but he's always come back to Russia. Russia is, you know, the main, the main focus of, of espionage fiction for him. Um, and yeah, well, the, I mean, that we this, kind of cycled back to the Cold War, you know, having been through other, you know, desert extremities, you know, wherever yeah. we are over in Asia. But, you know, here we are back again, face to face, you know, Biden and Putin going head to head. It's almost like a reprise of, you know, I mean, I remember the Cold War. I remember being trained in school, you know, to hide under our desk and the whole thing because I'm old. But, um, you know, and I thought after the wall, we all sort of thought we'd move on from that and we'd write other sorts of things. But here we are again. Yeah, I mean, I think this, I sometimes rather glibly say that Putin is the gift that keeps giving. I mean, he, the two game changers in 21st century spy fiction were 9-11 and, and Putin. And, and what flows from 9-11 with Iraq and Afghanistan and, 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 and WikiLeaks and all the rest of it um, could fill a hundred spy novels and equally um, the, the aftermath of, of of Putin's rise to power and, and his sort of gangster regime and the and the assassinations and, and the uh, the geographical threats that you're seeing even tonight, you know, to with Ukraine. You can't really um, get that ideological thing that you had when people were, you know, it was a communist sort of a thing. I mean, Putin is not really a communist. And so well, no, I mean, well, Putin was in was in the KGB and and, and he's he's I think he said that the, the sort of the worst day of his life was the was the day that the Soviet Union collapsed yeah. and that he wants to restore the sort of might of Mother Russia to to its sort of it, it, it sort of high tide of, of, of the Soviet Union in the 1940s and 50s. Um, hence Ukraine and Kazakhstan and all the rest. Um, so that's his the nature of his delusion but he and it's probably the reason why he's so fascinating to contemporary readers and and, and commentators is, is because he is a sort of throwback to to the to the cold war he is a um a sort of disciple of brezhnev and and and, and uh, not even i mean he probably despises gorbachev for letting for for, for letting the you know leaving he's the a throwback to the czars russia has been an attraction exactly yeah forever. no i mean he, he's really a fascinating figure because he's, he's i mean another you ask it yeah. you know if other countries have produced this kind of literature. And I, you know, a lot of it has to do with really what's important to them. There are in, in reality, a few cultures that are imbued with espionage organizations that it's part of their DNA. Um, Israel is one, yeah. Russia certainly, Britain has a long standing. I mean, America didn't do anything until right after the war. The CIA wasn't started until post-war. So they were the new kids on the block, but they certainly made up for it in terms of ambition and breadth. But is there going to be a great series of espionage novels coming out of Italy? I doubt it, um, I, you know, because it doesn't reflect the reality of Italian life, so far as I know, anyway. Maybe there's a Box 88 coming out of Milano, and, you know, we just don't know it. I, I cannot say, Joe. I, I don't know at this moment. <laughs> Well, see, I think it's a fascinating question. You're right. You know, I think different countries have. One of the things I think is so great about contemporary publishing, whether crime or otherwise, is how international it's become. You know, for a long time, it seemed like most crime and, and spy fiction, whatever, was, was English language driven. You know, it was American or it was British and all. And, you know, but and Japan was a huge market for it now. But now we're seeing so much original stuff re being written in Japanese or, you know, African novels are really coming on strong and so forth. And so we're getting a lot more perspective as readers, I think, cultural perspectives than we, you know, than we once had. I wonder if that's coming from TV. I wonder if that's coming from Netflix series like Fauda, which is that amazing Israeli series. Um, the Bureau, which if you haven't seen, is, is an incredible uh, French television series about the DGSE, which is the, their equivalent of CIA MI6. Uh, so call my agent, which is like beyond <laughs> yeah, It's like call my agent with spies. Um, I think so. so, so I mean, we, watch, on, we watch the, is the only film I've ever TV seen that Sorry, managed Jeff? to film. The, the Bureau is the only film I've ever seen that managed to make Paris ugly. You know, there isn't any scene where they're on the Rue Honore or something. Yeah. But call my but it's agent. It's great though, Joe, isn't it? Are you a fan? Yeah, yeah very much so. Call my agent, I adored. You know, for all, for all the right frivolous reasons. It was funny and it was beautiful and it was Paris. 
Yeah. And it was really French. Yeah. But I mean, there's a lot of wonderful stuff. If you watch MHC or if you watch Acorn, you get Australia. I mean, there's, I think it's, it's really exciting that we're getting original voices, which of course means that translators are becoming more essential. I think the scan, the whole Scandinavian or Nordic, Nordic noir thing really gave it a push, but then yeah. other cultures, you know, have, have come along. Anyway, um, Patrick, why don't you pop in and see if we have questions from our doubtless stunned audience? <laughs> no, what a, what a great, fascinating conversation. Um, I've been enjoying it myself, just listening. Um, yes, we do have some, we do have some questions. Um, but I'm just curious before we get to those, how do you, how do you both rate, um, you know, people like Graham Greene, you know, some of his his early efforts, uh, or Charles McCary, you know, some of those those kind of writers. Well, very highly. I mean, uh, to be compared to Graham Greene, I think, is one of the ultimate critical hopes. I think he's a truly significant major writer. As for the quote entertainments, you know, I mean, when people talk about him being a thriller or espionage writer, what they're really thinking about is the Third Man. They're not thinking about this gun for hire pleasurable as that is. I mean, they're terrific books and they're really fun, but I always love the anecdote about Stamboul Train, which is that actually he only had enough money to get as far as Germany, I think. So all of, all of the Turkish scenes are completely made up, you know. He's <laughs> but he goes on to write seriously wonderful books. And it's, it's you know, for me, what what's exciting about other writers are is that something has to be happening on the page, something within the prose. And, and you read a paragraph or a page of Graham Greene and you think, my God, that's, that's really good. He really knows he can do it. So I rate him very highly. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I mean Graham Greene and, and John Le Carre are my, uh, they're sort of in an American, they're kind of Babe Ruth to me, they're, they, um, both of them. I think in some ways, Graham Greene is the, if you can characterize this thing, is the, is the is the greater writer purely for the the range of his material, the psychological complexity, um, the 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 I think sort of sentence by sentence you'd have a hard time separating them as sort of as as prose stylists, but certainly towards the toward in the sort of latter phase of Lacarre's career, I think his ego, I suppose you could characterize that was was too much front and center. Uh, his it was a sort of slightly kind of um, uh, sarcastic voice, so sort of in, in the books. Whereas Green always disappeared from his fiction, um, and and it was sort of purer as a as a consequence. It's so hard, hard to explain. Talking of Charles McCarry, there you go. Look, I, I'm, I'm reading uh, <laughs> one of his late, late, later books, and and a kind of much underrated or not, certainly sort of unknown American spy novelist. Um, we see we sort of get all the headlines over here with Dayton and and, and Le Carre and Ambler, um, but but you have uh, the late Jason Matthews, wonderful, and and, and obviously Joseph and and, and, and Charles McCarry, yeah, they're fantastic. He's yeah. also Jason just Matthews just as an really addition, wonderful, it's tragic we lost him so soon. You know, I mean, he, I don't know, wasn't it Pantry Drivers right? The late great Philip Kerr had an absolutely wonderful time putting Graham Greene into his 1956 Bernie on the French Riviera, and you know, and all he did was play bridge and have you're thinking, of, you're thinking of Somerset Mom. Was the Somerset Mom instead? Yeah. Not yeah. Graham Greene. Okay. It would have worked with Greene too, though. Yeah, well, yeah, it was fun. Anyway, carry on. Questions? Sure. It, was, it was mom who described Riviera as a shady place, a sunny place for shady people. That's wonderful. <laughs> no, I, 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 love, I love Green and I love his, the variety of what he put out, you know, from Ministry of Fear to, uh, you know, Our Man in Havana to Brighton Rock. I mean, he was just all over the place. Yeah. Seems like yeah. a fairly unpleasant human being, but hey, you know, reading those, those wonderful biographies that came out. I think it was Norman Sherry. Anyway, I digress. Let me get to some of these questions here. Um, let's see, uh, Ross wants to know for Charles, uh, what was your inspiration for creating Box 88 rather than using the existing agencies? Um, we were sort of touching on this before that, that I think one of the things I've realized over time is that I, I thought that it was very important to be as accurate as I could be about the business of espionage, certainly on, on this side of the Atlantic. And, and, and I, I made it sort of my business to, to, to check with people in that world and say, would this happen? Would you do this, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I came to realize that actually that didn't matter. 
um, and that what I was sort of repeating myself now, but what people want, wanted was exciting stories. And I thought, what if, because the, there's also a lot of red tape over here, if you, certainly with MI5, if you want to do something, let's say that I want to go and uh, place a microphone in somebody's house and, or, or bug their phone or whatever, I have to get the home secretary to, to sign that off. Um, if I'm working for my fire, there's all this, you know, lots of sort of protocols you have to go through. But what if there was an agency where you you could, which had very little um, political oversight, um, only very few members of my five, my six CIA knew that it even existed, and it just took a, a kind of an elite bunch of of people from those organisations and did the things that uh, SIS is not really allowed to do or, or or wouldn't say that it was doing. For example, assassinations, um, and that's where Box eighty eight really came from. Um, and I've just always been fascinated by America and the, and, and the um, enormously kind of complicated relationship between our two countries and how that would work politically and, and in terms of a, uh, in the context of espionage, if such an organization did exist. I actually, I spoke to somebody who recently retired from I6 and I said, I'm thinking of doing this and I'm thinking of creating this um, sort of super secret agency called Box 88. He said, I was so sure that something like that existed and they just weren't telling me about it. So I leave, I'm on, I'm onto something, but but it's it's basically fictional. Well, you know, it's funny a, a name that hasn't been brought up into this conversation. Uh, you know, Barbara and I, and I'm sure both of you are well familiar with Stan Fesperman. You know, mm. a terrific. Well, he's writer. he's going to be speaking to Charles um, later. As, oh really, as McCarran. But I'll tell you who we haven't brought into this conversation is Alan First, who I thought wrote some really wonderful. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if he's still writing. Um, his last one might be two or three years old. Joe, do you remember? Yeah, but uh, he is writing. In fact, I spoke to his agent, who's also my agent today, and I said, what's going on with Alan? He said, he's finishing a book. So. Oh, I'm so glad, because I think he writes. I loved his book, you know, Paris, the Budapest to Paris book. I can't remember. It was kind of his breakout book. I thought it was absolutely fabulous. And Martin Cruz Smith, you know, there are lots of people that are Kind of yeah, but wasn't that genre. Katie Renko a policeman? I mean, you know, it's easy yeah. to think of those as espionage, but those aren't spy stories, really. Yeah, they're bits. different. Let's see here, Barbara. Were you thinking of the Rasp earlier? The Philip? McDonald? I might have been. I don't remember the title. I remember it's a great movie. Um, yeah, and the British Library crime classics, which I. Um, Poison Pen Press started to publish, and Martin Edwards is the editor, has republished, I think, three of the Philip McDonald espionage novels as part of that whole ongoing series. And I really enjoyed them, partly because they're Scottish. I mean, there's a Scottish element to them as well as, you know, but we could all the way go back to Buchan. You know, we could already back to, um, I'm going blank, but, you know, what's his great? The 39, 39 Steps, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and a great movie with Robert Donat, if I remember right. Correct. Which I'm almost old enough to have seen when it was made, but <laughs> nonetheless. Uh, let's see here. Hmm. What else do we have? Um, okay, Billy. Billy wants to know. Um, do you? This is for both of you, jo uh, Joseph and uh, Charles. Do you spend? Do you both spend a lot of time visiting the locations in your books, or, or can you talk about your research in general? In my case, yes, absolutely. In fact, it's one of the things that drives the book. Um, it's I use it as an excuse to keep going back to some place I really want to know more about. Uh, Berlin, we've already talked about. This is the third novel that's been set there. But I, a more interesting example would be Istanbul Passage, where I had gone as a tourist because I'd always wanted to go. I fell in love with it. Who doesn't? There's nothing unusual about that. But every time I read the guidebooks about it, it stopped with Ataturk. And I thought, well, what happened afterwards? What happened in the time that interests me? And I came across the fact that it was this incredible listening post all during World War II, because it's 20 kilometers away from the hot war, but it sits it, it, sits it out as a neutral country so that everyone is in the hotel bars working for other intelligence agencies. And I thought, my God, it's the real Casablanca. How can you not? want to write about this. And I went back and back. I think I was there five times, maybe four or five times. And each one liked the city even more. There are just wonderful depths to it. I just loved it. Me too. I keep hoping that Erdogan will trip over his financial policy and go away so I can go back to Istanbul because I'm not really a fan, but I'm not sure I want to go there. When it was such a wonderful secular state. 
and now it's you know now it's not now it's what it is but look at what we are so you know it's it's a hard time in the world but nothing is forever that's very true carry on patrick well charles did you want to address that no, no I, I, I agree. I think it's it's, it's very important to, to 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 go to these places. I always try to go if I can, and and rather like Joe used it as an excuse to go back again and again. Um, it's amazing how many plot ideas, as well as just sort of geographical location ideas, come to me as I'm walking the streets of, for example, Istanbul or Odessa or uh, Madrid or, or whatever. You, just to sort of smell the air and and, and taste the food and and. Um, and absorb. I've just I've just been to Senegal actually for the third book in the kite series because kite's going to be there in 1995 in Dakar. And there's I don't think there's any way that I could possibly write this book without having gone there and 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 walked the ground. It's uh, I, I I don't know how historical novelist sort of Bernard Cornwall got, has a time machine that takes him back to sort of the 1340s. He must do. I think that's an extraordinary skill, Hilary Mantel skill to to bring to life a place that they've obviously never visited is amazing. So and when you publish that the book, operative. we are going to talk because I've actually been to the car Senegal. Ah, have you? Okay. I have, I have indeed. And, you know, ferried out to the, the slave trading island and the whole bit. Oh, wow, wow. So I'm sorry, Joe, did I interrupt you? No, 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 by no means. I was just going to say that walking is the operative word. I think you really have to walk a city. You know, when they, when people say research, they imagine that I'm in archives, you know, reading old Stasi headquarter documents, but that's not the case. What you're really doing is figuring out where would your character have lived? I mean, where, where could he afford the flat? Would you need a tram to get to work? Could you walk to work? I mean, all of those day-to-day details that would describe a life. You know, you can walk down a street and you have to know everything that you're seeing on the street, but the reader only has to know two things. You have, or three things at the most. You don't want to overload it, but you need to know the place well enough so that it's it's just part of you. You can really feel it. At least I think that's the case. It's interesting, Joe. I'm, I'm basically, I'm researching in the way that you've always researched in the sense of you're going back to a city that now is transformed beyond all recognition, Berlin, but you're having to find little parts of it that either weren't bombed out by the allies or, or have, have, have remained in, intact. And going to Dakar, the, the, the city as was in 1995, when I kind of needed it to be, has also changed beyond recognition in the last 25 years. So I, I really recognize that, that you, you need to get into a, a, a part of the city and, and imagine yourself into the character's apartment or the restaurant, the cafe where he or she might eat and, and, and walking the streets and what they would look like and would that shop be there, would that apartment block have been built by all that sort of thing. It's um, it's kind of vital to do because somebody inevitably will email you and say, you may not know this, but <laughs> and, they'll, and, they'll, and they'll correct you, which is infuriating. I mean, but, if, if you give yourself a little rope if you do Los Alamos, which is completely different or Berlin, which is yeah. very different because of the bombing. Ironically, the, I think the most difficult place I ever had to write about from the point of view of accuracy was Venice because the whole point of it is that it never ever changes and that it's exactly the way it was before. So if you have somebody turning right and a, an alert reader would realize that that had pitched them into the canal, they'll send you an email and say, no, don't you know that isn't the way from the Zat today, et cetera, et cetera. So you really have to be careful. You know, a real classic event is Tom Bradby's book, Ring, which was he wrote and set in 1920 Shanghai. And Shanghai is unrecognizable today as compared to how it was when um, and Tom wrote that novel. Um, I was there in 1997, which was when, you know, right before the handover of Hong Kong and so forth, and there was nothing on the island. I mean, the island was basically empty. And, you know, I don't want to go back because now it looks like Sydney or, you know, whatever with nothing but glass high rises and the whole bit in such well, a Barbara, short Barbara, I, I shouldn't tell you this, but you will, um... You will be able to go back in history because it's the set, it's the setting of my next book, the one I'm working on at the moment. I'm delighted to hear that. I mean, I, I just thought, between us, we don't want someone to steal it. Right. No. All right. Well, we'll be quiet about that. Right. So, Patrick, <laughs> anything else? Yeah. Has either of you read um, David Peace's books that are set in um, occupied Tokyo just after the war? Uh, the latest one's called Tokyo Redux. Really fascinating. You know the 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 entire city's destroyed. The population is starving. Um, really good books. 
um, there's such a diversity of different voices in the genre. It's really- There it's really are. David Downing wrote a book called Jack the Spy, which is absolutely one of my favorite spy novels. Did either of you run across it? He's a British author living in France and a, an interesting guy. He wrote, he wrote a whole series about the um, name for train stations in Berlin. You know, zoo station and whatever station. And they were really station. good. Yes, but then okay. he wrote, I think there were 10 of them, but then he wrote Jack the Spy, which starts in China and wanders all around. Oh God, it's just a wonderful book. And he's probably somebody that you don't, you may not have run across, but I think they're fabulous yeah. books. Um, let's see here. Maybe, I know we're running a little bit over here, but maybe one more final question. Uh, Nathan wants to know, uh, I would love to hear about both of your writing processes. For example, do you have a regular daily writing time, you know, specific word count you shoot for? Uh, Charles mentioned going to the Airbnb in Madrid to write. Is that a regular part of his process? Thanks. Um, I, I have. Come, I used to live here, so and I've come back every few years and now I come back sort of slightly more regularly to, to just to have a little bit of um, to, to get into the zone so to speak and have no distraction from from younger children and friends and going out to lunch and all the rest all the sort of business of of, of daily life in London um, but I'm not one of those writers who leaps out of bed and has sort of 3,000 words in him and, 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 and just gets it out and then it has, still has time to go for a cocktail at six o'clock I do I find it very difficult I'm not a sort of natural writer if that makes sense um, I tend to always try to leave a, an entire day free. So I get to my desk at some point in the morning, probably around about 10 o'clock and never meet a friend or anybody for lunch and just leave the whole day free. And then at some point in the day, there'll be a sort of sweet spot and I'll get my work done between let's say sort of four o'clock and 4.55 or something like that. It, it just seems to be that way. I used to be better in the mornings, um, but I know writers, I interviewed Anthony Horowitz in, in London a few years ago at around about this, well, certainly this time of night in Europe, around about eight o'clock in the evening. And he, he I, I was going to go off for dinner later and then go home and watch telly and go to bed, but he was going to go home and carry on writing. Um, he's just, he's sort of just has one of those minds that's just churning out a story and material and, and, he, and he can't sort of keep, keep, keep the brain quiet. Um, so everybody's different, but I do, I do think the, the fundamental thing is that you must give yourself the opportunity to be creative and you must give yourself the opportunity to do the work. Um, and for me, that just means leaving, obviously, the whole day free and hoping that um, uh, inspiration strikes. But obviously, late nights and alcohol and, and all this sort of stuff is, is not a great idea. Does that all um, change as yeah. deadlines approach? Yeah. Well, it's, you know, I'm, I'm actually at the beginning of it. I'm, I'm not even towards the end. I just um, I'm, I'm quite far behind on Kite 3. And so I just needed to get away and, and really focus. Um, and as Joe will attest, these books start to sort of take over your subconscious and the sort of the deeper you go into the manuscript as it were, you're sort of thinking about nothing else. I mean, it does become all consuming. Um, I like the phrase in the zone. I think that's exactly what happens. Uh, my work habits are very bourgeois. When I'm actually writing, I walk to the New York Public Library, which is about two miles from my house so that you get your requisite exercise. But what you're really doing is putting yourself in the zone you may be walking along and looking at things around you, but in fact, there's this undercurrent that's thinking, what would she have said when she got out of the, you know, the restaurant or blah, blah, blah. So that by the time I get to the library, I'm in the book and my head is in the book. I then proceed to work there for several hours and then, come up, I'm, you know, it's a, it's a, when you're actually writing, I think the more methodical you, can be the better off you're going to be because it's all over the map otherwise and you know the head just goes down into it there will be moments when you're working and all of a sudden you lift your head and you think oh my god an hour has gone by and i'm not even aware of it because you're so thoroughly in, in, involved in the in the prose yeah and then and then years later you'll you'll go back and look at something you wrote and you're like what was i thinking where was i how did i manage to get that out it's a, it's a very strange process Right. I mean, I write in longhand and I'm not a Luddite. I do put it into the computer eventually, but I usually put it in after I've finished the whole thing in longhand, which means there's practically a year between seeing what's on the page and you kind of, oh, gosh, no, no. So it constitutes a kind of first edit pass as you're putting it into the computer. That's interesting. I write fast on the computer. Do you, so, so then, Joe, do you have a complete longhand manuscript before yeah. you ever put it into the computer? 
you, or do you put it in as you go along? No, I, I usually do it all at once and it's just wow. hell on your back because you're typing for three weeks straight or something. But, and it's the way it's worked for me. And I think we're all superstitious, you know, whatever's worked before you should just right. not mess with. I need to, Rob and Dana, I'm still talking. Sorry, <laughs> it <laughs> took well the, so let me, let me wind up by saying, cause everybody always wants to know um, about film. So you have had in point of fact, um, some film offers, right? Um, Charles, but have any of them come to fruition? I know that Colin Firth uh, optioned, what was it, a foreign country? Yeah, so, so Colin Firth's company has the rights to um, the Kell trilogy. Uh, I think Colin is now a little bit too old to play Thomas Kell because it was a 10 or 11 years ago that he bought the option. Um, but it's in development with HBO and um, uh, Spy by Nature has been in, in what they call development hell since about 1873, but, it, but I, we live in hope that it'll be made. <laughs> Joe's had the great, the, the great joy, a hope of, of, of seeing the good German turn into a film and meeting George Clooney and spending the evening with Kate Blanchett. That's what we all dream of. Um, I haven't had that yet. Although weirdly, I, I did write a, a movie script not connected to my books at all um, called The Plane, which was, which was rewritten by subsequent writers and, um, as, as the Hollywood way. But it was shot this summer with Gerard Butler. So I have had a film made, but just not one of my books. I love it. Well, thank you very much for your time. Don't go away because I'm going to tell you my funny story, but I think we should release the audience. So thank you very much for joining us. I forgot to mention that Charles very kindly signed book plates for Box 88, which um, are on their way to us, probably will get in tomorrow. So do grab a copy. Um, we sold out of our signed British edition, which we did get from London because we have a partner there. Um, and that'll be great. And as far as Joe goes, the Berlin Exchange, he has kindly agreed to sign Boku to Books, which we have set up to send to us, as he has kindly done for all of his books. So, yay. Anyway, thanks, guys. Patrick, you want to sign us off from sure. Public Forum? Absolutely. Thanks, everybody, right. for watching on Facebook and YouTube. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them and your help would be appreciated, please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.